Good evening to those in the United States and a special shout out to anybody who is joining us from either Europe or the Middle East for whom it is either deep in, in the middle of the night or very <laughs> It's a pleasure to host, uh, on behalf of the Middle East Institute of the National University of Singapore, today's seminar on Arab public opinion and why, whether it matters and why it matters. We're very fortunate to have two very exper experienced scholars and pollsters who've done this for many years, uh, David Pollock of the um, Washington Institute for Near East Policy, uh, as well as Michael Robbins of the Arab Barometer. What I suggest that we do is that we'll open this in the first segment of this, of this webinar with uh, me asking our two uh, speakers uh, a set of questions. Questions will be the same to both of them. Uh, so give us an understanding of why these uh, opinion polls, given the political environment in much of the Middle East, have validity, to what degree they matter and are taken into account, and how you operate in an environment in which you have uh, frequently authoritarian, if not autocratic rule, with severe restrictions or degrees of restrictions on freedom of expression. Uh, as well as a, a focus on what matters to public opinion in the Middle East, and particularly in the Arab world, uh, in terms of foreign policy, but all the more so with the uh, developments that we've seen in recent weeks and months, with the establishment of diplomatic relations between Gulf states and Israel. And then the third set around the issues of what, what really matters to uh, in, to public opinion in terms of their aspirations, their, um, um, uh, their desires, their attitudes towards governance, towards religion, for example. And then hopefully we'll open it up to a, um, a, a discussion uh, with, with the floor and with the audience. And we really encourage the audience to participate. Um, you can do so in two forms. One is, if you don't want to pose the question yourself, uh, then please enter it into the chat uh, and address it to the MEI events people, and they'll make sure that I see it. Or uh, you can raise your hand, um, and then you'll be called upon. And if, if and when you are called upon, please be so kind to, one, turn on your camera, unmute yourself, if, the MEI um, events people have not mute, unmuted you and uh, tell us who you are. So thank you very much, uh, D David and Michael, and thank you for the audience for joining us. Let me start off with asking both David and Michael, why should we care about these uh, opinion polls and what do they represent? Um, we're often, you are often doing these polls in, country, in countries where there's no freedom of expression or, very, or restricted freedom of expression. There's restricted freedom of the, of the media. So the media often reflects an official position rather than what may be uh, alive among the public. And perhaps you can also talk about a little bit about the methodology and, uh, of your polling and how that helps you um, ensure that you are getting a true reflection. And finally, if you could touch on um, how the pandemic, which obviously with restrictions on face-to-face -face meetings, travel, and so forth, how that's impacting what you can and cannot do. Um, David, do you want to start? Sure. Thanks very much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with you, and I really appreciate this opportunity. Um, I'll try to be pretty brief. Um, there's a lot that you asked about, and I'll start with the first part of your question about why it matters. Um, I, I think from my own experience over about the last 30 years, um, or 35 years, I guess by now, <laughs> doing this kind of research first uh, for the US government and in the last 12 years, uh, outside government, completely independent at a think tank here in DC. 
I, I have seen that sometimes public opinion matters greatly, even maybe especially in autocratic countries, because uh, in when public opinion reaches a certain critical threshold, it can bring people out into the streets and um, to the point where you have something like the Arab Spring um, a decade ago, or when I started doing this work, you had something like mass demonstrations um, reacting to Saddam Hussein's invasion of Kuwait in 1990, which was a terrible event in many ways. But for me, I have to say, to be brutally honest, was my big professional breakthrough. All of a sudden, people in the US government, where I was holed up as an ordinary bureaucrat, uh, said, hey, wait a second. <laughs> we really need to pay attention to the Arab street. Uh, because there are millions of people demonstrating against us in Tunis or Amman or um, other places around the region. And uh, we need to know, is Saddam Hussein really a hero to the entire Arab world or not? And how is that going to affect our decisions uh, for war and peace? And which countries we should work with or not work with in this really... Um, quite significant international crisis. So that's when I realized, first of all, that it can matter a lot, especially in a crisis. Uh, second of all, that Arab governments pay attention to their own public opinion, even if they're military dictatorships or monarchies uh, or some other variant of government that doesn't really have free elections or free expression. But they are interested in at least getting some sense of the pulse of the street and the threshold around which people might or might not mobilize against them or for them. Uh, and so they do their own polls of their own people, um, many of them, often secretly, but they do it and they pay attention to it. And I know they pay attention to my polls too. And um, if it matters to them, then it also matters to any government or any expert who's interacting with or wants to understand what's going on in those countries. And that's when I also realized, and this brings me to the last thing that I want to say right now, <laughs> um, to try to answer a very complicated question that you raised about, well, how valid are these results anyway in places like that that are closed societies and authoritarian regimes? That I realized that if you're, if you're willing to um, bend the rules a little bit, and I mean the methodological rules and even sometimes the sort of uh, social rules, uh, you can actually find very, I think, credible ways of measuring public opinion, uh, even in places like Saudi Arabia or in Syria or in Libya in the middle of a civil war or in Iraq in the middle of, you know, uh, constant violence and turmoil and repression. And um, I, I, you know, to, for want of time, I'll just say, um, a couple of things about how you can and cannot do that in my in my view. Um, and for anyone who's interested in much more gory detail about this, I wrote a whole big fat monograph about it in 2008, published by the Washington Institute. And the title of that is Slippery Holes, Uses and Abuses of Survey Research in Arab States. So that explains a great, great length with many real world examples, my answer to this important question. But very briefly for now, I'll just say this. Um, first of all, I think that the best polls in Arab societies are face-to-face -face polls, not telephone or online polls or any other variant of that. And this is mostly for cultural reasons. It has nothing to do with technical penetration of computers or cell phones or any of the other uh, sort of standard technical issues. It has to do with cultural norms and taboos. And in Arab societies, generally speaking, people feel freer 
talking to a stranger in person than they do talking to a stranger on the telephone. In, here in the United States, or I think in most Western societies, this sounds absurd or illogical. It tends to be the opposite here. You'd rather, if you're going to talk to a stranger, you'd rather do it anonymously, you know, so, so to speak, on the phone, rather than have somebody knock on your door or come into your house. But in Arab societies, it tends to be the opposite. So that's one good reason why face-to-face -face calls, even though they're much more expensive and time-consuming and um, problematic from, for many reasons, just practical, logistical reasons, are better. Uh, and online polls, I think, suffer from some of the same issues, uh, complicated further by self-selection issues and sampling issues and all kinds of other things. So the polls that I rely on mostly are in Arab countries, uh, not in all Middle Eastern countries, in Israel or Turkey or Iran, you can do phone polls, and I do. Um, but in Arab countries, I like to do face-to-face -face polls wherever possible. That's number one. Number two, so how do I ask about controversial issues like, uh, you know, Israel or Iran or Hezbollah or Islam or any of the other things in a closed society and a restricted political arena like Saudi Arabia or for that matter these days um, Egypt or any of these other places. And the short answer is I invented a ridiculously simple way to do it, uh, which I did at the US government's behest in, during that first Gulf crisis in 1990. And I'm still doing it 30 years later and I'm getting away with it. I don't know why, but I am. And that is that in most of these countries, including even in the Gulf or in Egypt uh, or in Syria uh, right now, um, believe it or not, many commercial companies are licensed to do and actually carry out pretty routinely commercial market research surveys. And they ask mostly about consumer products or other innocuous questions like what kind of shampoo do you like or what kind of car you know would you like to drive or what airline do you prefer or stuff like that and what i do is i find companies like that and i ask them how about if i just tack on five or six or seven relatively um political questions on top of your commercial survey how about that and uh Nobody has to know about this. Um, the government doesn't have to know. Nobody has to know. I'm never going to tell anybody what, you know, which companies I'm actually working with. You can count on me. And that's what I've been doing for 30 years. And it works. And um, I have lots of different, you know, statistical and other ways of trying to control for uh issues of intimidation or you know disingenuous responses or all kinds of other things like that that would distort the results but um i found ways to to do that um and i think that although this method is not methodologically pure from a strict social science perspective because you're mixing up questions about shampoo with questions about politics in the same survey, uh, there are ways to um, deal with that. And I, I won't go into detail unless somebody really wants me to, but um, I think that the results that I have are, uh, are pretty darn good, despite the really, really great difficulty. Now you asked, last thing, you asked about COVID and how that affects our work in the last year or so. Well, it certainly has a great effect on my work. Uh, I, I did um, two surveys in uh, February, just before things really got bad. And, you know, they started with lockdowns and quarantines and all that. And, and since then, I have um, had great difficulty actually doing, especially face-to-face -face surveys. I mean, you can still do phone surveys or online surveys, but I don't think they're that good. Um, and so that gets around COVID, but it doesn't get around the other problems that I mentioned earlier. Uh, so I, I do have some companies that are willing to work 
uh, around when lockdowns ease up and they see a window of opportunity and they have very, very elaborate safety and health protocols. Uh, and they're still in business. So I was able to do a survey in June, for example, in just this past June in four Arab countries, Egypt, Jordan, UAE, and Saudi Arabia, face to face, door to door, right, despite COVID. Uh, and I'm hoping to do another one uh, actually this month. Um, and, uh, but it, it's slow, it's slow. And it's, um, you know, more complicated. And that about sums up, I think, where I am on this. Thank you. Fascinating, thank you, David. Uh, Michael, do you want to take a stab at all of this? Sure, no, I, I agree with a lot of what David said to, to start off. Um, you know, certainly it is a challenge to, um, to look at, uh, look at these countries and, and work with, through the conditions that there are uh, throughout them. But I do think that clearly, as David uh, elucidated, public opinion does matter there. The public matters in all countries. Um, and certainly the, the will to be governed uh, is something that's, that's important and that we can see. And, you know, I, I think a lot of times we, we may miss things. And, you know, there was a surprise that we saw coming. Um, and, you know, for instance, in Algeria, there was a, a yeah. sense that Algeria was pretty stagnant. It wouldn't change. And we actually got out of the field. How much they uh, are? With our, I can check there, yeah. We, uh, we actually got out of the field um, about four days before the Harak um, broke out. And, you know, as we actually looked at the data, one of the things we saw was that uh, the rates of protests had actually increased pretty dramatically. But one of the differences was they hadn't actually increased in Algiers in the capital, where most of the, the observers may be based. And, you know, other people had done this, you know, Bobby Parks and others had looked at this and, you know, track some of the protests that were taking place. But as we looked at this, we could see it taking place. And I think it really is key to, to not just think of the capital or not just think of the surrounding area as, you know, defining the country, but looking at this across the entire country and seeing what trends we see. You know, certainly if we had had that survey, even I think a few, um, a few months before, we might have been able to say that, you know, there really was a challenge of, of, of you know, a potential unrest in Algeria because people were tired, that they weren't willing to... Uh, to accept this and even though there was more draconian measures in the capital there wasn't that necessarily taking place elsewhere in the countryside and so small-scale protests different things were taking place that we we didn't necessarily see and, and i think fell under the radar because algeria is not one of the countries that's as well known so certainly as we try and understand as we try and look across the countries there is a huge amount of variation there's a huge amount of differences and understanding that and thinking about that is, is key and as, as david said you know I, I, a very good point is that many of the governments are doing this themselves you know we we certainly know that we see that they're not running the government through elections but they're running the government through public opinion polls at times <laughs> trying to find the hot spots trying to find the places that um they need to control that they need to you know manage to to end the anger to do something whether it be you know in, in certain countries build a hospital give some type of services to a, an area you know it is really a key place and and certainly when you can't see the results through free and fair elections you know opinion polls are, are perhaps a, a, another if they're done reliably really good measure of understanding that and, and you know the public always does matter you know the arab spring uh, proved that you know certainly the protest david talked about did as well but um you can't ignore it and and certainly there also is a spectrum that there are countries that are very authoritarian there are countries that are less so that manage it differently and and understanding how the public plays in that. And the public knows the red lines, you know, I mean, Jillian Schwedler's done work on this recently about the protests in Jordan, about the specific rules of the game. And so certainly understanding that, and the public knows this, you know, this isn't necessarily a, a monolithic region that, you know, has, doesn't have variation and, and the public does matter. And, and we see that in many places. In terms of, can we trust the surveys? Um, that's a question we get a lot. Um, you know, in fact, I, I sometimes just will, will say to people, you know, you, well, the, the same question can be posed in the United States. You know, we heard in 2016 about, quote unquote, shy Trump um, people, you know, who wouldn't admit that they supported Trump. I mean, people lie all the time. If I ask you on a survey, are you racist? Pretty much people are going to say no. Um, you know, maybe maybe there's a few who wouldn't. But, you know, people do have social desirability. They do have fear. They do have, you know, there is a context. This is a, an occasion where people are trying to tell you something through a survey. Um, you know, if they're willing to grant you the interview in any context. And so we always have to worry about the validity of the polls, you know, that, that certainly if they're not done well, if they're not thought out, if the measures aren't reliable, we do have problems, whether it be authoritarian or whether it be democratic. And so this is something we spend a huge, huge amount of time on, um, you know, with our project, trying to understand how do people think about it? How do they talk about it? What are ways we can ask this? What are ways that they, you know, are perhaps somewhat indirect? And so a lot of times, instead of asking one very pointed question, we'll ask a number of questions that, you know, people may not entirely sense what we're getting at, but it gives us together a combined battery of, of answers. So in sense of, you know, what's the role for religion in public life? 
you know, we ask this in a couple of different ways to try and get a sense of, you know, where people fit on the spectrum, that they may not be, you know, completely behind the Islamic point of view, Islamist point of view, they may not be completely behind the secular point of view, but how do we balance this out? And so, you know, one of the things that we really do is work to build trust. And I would have to agree with what David said, you know, that really face-to-face -face is the ideal situation in these countries to do this type of work. You know, one of the things it does is we can go, we can show people, we can try and build trust that this isn't some nefarious government purpose, um, you know, that's, that's trying to collect data or some other, you know, group, but it really is a, a project, a research project. You know, we have a website, you can see the results, the surveys have been done before. You know, people aren't thrown in jail from this, um, you know, from answering the surveys. And so there is a lot that we can do in the face-to-face -face environment, going to the door, knocking on the door. And I think, you know, one of the things that I always find fascinating is if we actually make contact with somebody in most of the countries where we work, we actually have about half or more of, of the population actually cooperating. You know, no one's at home that brings their response rate down, things like that. But people are actually willing to engage. And one of the questions we often get is, you know, why would you, you know, no one's ever really asking my opinion before. This isn't something that's as common here. And so it is actually kind of an interesting engagement to, to take this opportunity in, in, in place. And so, again, there's very few face-to-face -face surveys done in the United States, but response rates are much, much lower here. And, you know, if people don't want to answer the survey, if they don't, you know, have some, in, if the majority at least, don't have an inclination to answer, to, to want to take part, they would simply say no. You know, there's no, we don't give any incentives, we don't give anything else. People can simply say no, turn us around, and, you know, we go to another house. And so, you know, given the response rates we see, it does seem that, you know, people are very willing to at least engage us, and they can stop the interview at any time. And so if we are asking questions they don't want, and so our sense is that, you know, within someone's house, within, you know, the confines of, of the space that they choose, that they control, you know, this isn't necessarily the Stasi. This isn't someone who's, you know, listening to everything happening in the house. You can't necessarily say it in the streets, but you can say things in your own house with, uh, you know, at least in this type of environment, greater certainty. And, you know, people have, are often somewhat critical of the regime in many of the countries where we work. You know, they just don't take it to the square. They do it in their house. And that's seen as more acceptable. So there is a lot of sense. And, you know, we see this again to return to Algeria. Uh, one of a prominent pollster once told me that you can't survey Algeria. And I looked at our data and, you know, we see 5% of people say the government's doing, you know, this is before the Haraq. The government has a, you know, 100% rating on everything, but it's about 5%. And then, you know, if you look at it, the rest, people are very critical of the Algerian government before. And so, you know, if people really had that fear, it's one of the countries we'd expect to see that. And they are willing to tell us the truth, um, you know, particularly in that environment. Um, you know, we also do for very sensitive items, we try and design experiments. So people don't necessarily have to endorse something directly. They can endorse it indirectly. We have survey experiments and this is, gets into some technical literature. There's a lot of criticisms of these methods. We don't necessarily know for sure exactly what people are saying, but there are ways that we can get around this. And, you know, this has been developed and well-established in the United States and Europe and other places. And so we really think carefully about the questions and try to put people in a place where they can feel comfortable, give us an answer and not feel, you know, the social desirability pressure or fear, you know, from the government. So we do all we can. We can't do it perfectly in the United States and other places. People also don't give truthful answers sometimes. And that's part of, you know, what we work with, but we try and interpret the data, see what we, we we're finding. And then, you know, also not just take it necessarily exactly at face value, but really lend our insight into what we're seeing, what we can believe, and what we think the truth is from, you know, this indicator that we have. You know, one of the real challenges we face now, though, is COVID. And so we've always done face-to-face. -face. At this point, we um, are looking at still trying to do some face-to-face -face across the region, but it really is challenging, um, you know, to do it in a safe way for both the, uh, both the, the, field work teams and the respondents. I mean, you know, we, we really do value this data, but we really don't want to, you know, cause suffering out of this. It's, it's simply not worth it. And, you know, this is true in other instances too, you know, having field workers putting them in dangerous situations. We try and avoid that and rather substitute it, admit there's a bit more error in our polls than to, uh, you know, say that this is, um, to, you know, to, to have a bit more error than to put someone's life at risk or put them in serious jeopardy. And so that's kind of how we think of the COVID environment. One of the things that we're doing is trying to not let this crisis go to waste. And I, I agree with David here that, you know, foam surveys are not ideal, web surveys are not ideal, but at the same time, you know, that other countries have, have, in other contexts, we've been able to make those work, not necessarily perfectly, but it is something that we really want to embrace. And, you know, one of the regrets I have, as I was saying to you um, before we got on here, is we got out of the field again in Algeria, you know, four days before the Harak broke out. We would have loved to have some measure that we could have gotten in those days to see how people are changing their opinions. We had a baseline, we had the perfect survey, but we didn't necessarily have a method that we knew how to compare that. And so we want to take advantage in a sense of COVID to, you know, rethink, to see, can we do phone surveys? What are the, the challenges there? 
how are we getting differences? And we already, we've started this process and we're seeing some differences. The samples are different. The response mm -hmm. rates are far lower. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of challenges here. I don't think we're going to be able to reproduce what we've done. And we're not comparing the areas we're doing now to our trends mm -hmm. face to face because it's not valid to, to do so. We can't do that yet. But it is something that we want to think about. What are those biases? And you know, one of the fascinating things we're seeing is that interviewer effects um, tend to be lower on the phone than they do in person. And so mm -hmm. if someone comes and they look very religious, then people may, there's evidence showing that people give a right. response that is somewhat more religious right. in nature. Yeah. Or if it's yeah. a woman who's an interviewer, they'll give a response that's, you know, it's hard to say, I don't support women's rights to a woman who's interviewing you in your home. You know, but on the phone, that goes away to some extent. So one of the things we want to do is to think more about, you know, what are these effects? And maybe we could actually, on some certain things, leverage phone surveys if we understand better the sample and how to actually do that. And so we're exploring that. You know, we're also thinking about the, with uh, some text or push to web surveys that we could do. Um, again, not to say that this is there um, to the same extent. Uh, I think that, you know, this is in its infancy in our region. We have to understand a lot more about these effects. We're trying to design some of the experiments, again, not to replace the face-to-face, to take advantage in certain contexts, you know, of the ability to move them rapidly and to try and move ahead. Mm -hmm. So again, as, as Rahm Emanuel said, let no crisis go to waste. And in that sense, we were trying our best to learn from this um, to the greatest extent we can to not necessarily just preference one type of method, but to, you know, embrace other types of methods and, and really try and get at the best, uh, you know, triangulate if we need to in the future, the, what the pulse of public opinion is, because the goal is public opinion, not to necessarily do a survey, you know, um, to, in one method or another, but to really figure out what's the best way we can understand that. And so that, that's how we're trying to use COVID. Thank you. A lot of texture to understanding the validity of these polls. And I have lots of follow-up questions, but hopefully we can do that in sure. the question and answer. What I would like to move with both of you to is looking at public opinion and, uh, or, you know, and th that you've surveyed in terms of, um, uh, approaches towards foreign policy, mm -hmm. how important is foreign policy, mm -hmm. what are the foreign policy issues that are of greatest concern, and that may obviously differ in different parts right. of, the, of the Middle East and the Arab world. Um, clearly, you know, there's long been sort of certainly a, 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 a sense of what public opinion was on the issue of Palestine and Israel, um, there, that's clearly shifted, as we've seen, both in terms of the uh, the normalization of relations between the UAE, Bahrain, and Israel, as well as in terms of attitudes that are being expressed towards the Palestinians and the way that they have conducted their affairs. And so, I w I wonder whether both of you could could talk about one, sure. what are what is important, what is not important, and how you've seen. Uh, added, or whether you've seen attitudes shift and how you've seen those shifts. Yeah, sure. Oh, David, do you want to kick off? Yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, I, I jotted down a list of a few things that I think would help answer those questions. Uh, and again, I'm going to try to be very brief. Um, so first of all, if you ask people in the region and surveys, whether what they care about most, what are their top personal priorities? Uh, typically, in Arab societies, as in I think probably most places, most of the time, most people are going to say they're going to list personal issues like their family, their health, their children, their education, their um, uh, standard of living, um, that sort of thing, and only much lower down on the list of personal priorities are you typically going to get um, political issues of any kind, either foreign or domestic. Now, this is not always the case, not in every place. And Michael made a very important point that at different Arab countries differ significantly on all of these measures uh, and at different times. But that's the typical response pattern. And then if you ask, Okay, so now in terms of politics, uh, and by the way, religion typically is not among the top priorities that most people have. Um, usually if I give them a list, sometimes I ask in an open-ended way, that's very expensive and complicated. <laughs> uh, so usually I offer you know, lists of 
priorities and I ask people to rank them. And usually being a good Muslim uh, comes in lower than you know having a good education, having a good family life, being healthy, having a good standard of living, etc. Um, okay, so then if you ask them, now what about politics? Is are you more concerned about what's going on inside our country or more concerned about foreign policy issues? And this is a question that I've asked routinely in uh, about eight different Arab countries, um, typically for the last six years. And consistently, and this is across all eight countries and over this entire decade, you get a large majority of people like usually 75 or 80 percent saying that internal issues are more important for our country than any foreign policy issue. So that's a really important, I think, and surprising finding because <laughs> a lot of times when we think about these countries, we're, we're thinking about regional conflicts and, you know, Arab, Israeli, Iran, I don't know, all kinds of foreign policy issues. But that's not what most of them are thinking about most of the time or caring about. Okay. So now, then you get to the next level and you say, all right, well, you don't care that much about politics and you certainly don't care that much about foreign policy, but I want to ask you about foreign policy anyway. <laughs> okay. And that's actually what a lot of my surveys are doing. Um, and here's, I, I, I want to talk about three sets of issues just really briefly. That uh, I'll start with the Arab, Israeli, and Palestinian issue and normalization and all of that. So, first of all, you can see that the Palestinian issue in not every Arab country, but in a number of major Arab countries, has dropped a lot in terms of its priority among foreign policy issues. And people, especially in the Gulf, are much more concerned about other issues like Iran or Yemen or you know, terrorism uh, or something else, not about the Palestinians. They're much lower on the list than they used to be. And it's not only my surveys that I think demonstrate that, it's even surveys by the Zogby organization that in the past used to show very high priority for the Palestinian question. I think sometimes by asking loaded questions about it, but that's a whole other story. But now Zogby polls are also showing that that issue has dropped uh, a lot in priority for many Arab publics. But that's not the case actually in Israel's neighbors. It's very interesting in Egypt or Jordan or Lebanon. Uh, the Palestinian issue is still a pretty high priority. It's not the overwhelmingly, you know, top priority for most people, but it's uh, probably um, number one or number two for a plurality of the people, maybe around 40%, something like that, in those countries. So there's a, there's a real difference here in the most recent polls that I've done uh, on this. And um, now, if you ask, what about normalization with Israel or peace with Israel or two-state solution or all those sorts of things? Um, then you get a clear trend um, upward in favor of support for a two-state solution in, uh, especially in the Gulf. But I think uh, you can also, I also see it, at least in my surveys in, in Jordan or Egypt or Lebanon. I, I haven't actually done my own surveys in North Africa about this question in recent years, so I don't know where things are in Morocco or Algeria or Tunisia or Sudan or you know, Libya. Um, uh, and I, I think one of the most interesting questions that I, um, I, I formulated to try and understand this a little bit better was I started asking about five years ago in these eight Arab countries, Egypt, Jordan, Lebanon, and five of the six Gulf Arab countries, all except Oman. Okay, and I started asking this question. Do, do you think that it would be a good idea for Arab governments or Arab states to offer incentives to both the Israelis and the Palestinians in order to reach a compromise. 
in order to moderate their position and reach a compromise. And to my surprise, I found that there was uh, solid majority support in every single Arab society, including in the Gulf, including in Saudi Arabia, um, in favor of that proposition. And I know that, th I mean, this is exactly what the UAE and Bahrain just did. They offered Israel an incentive to <laughs> moderate its position, to not to annex parts of the West Bank. And it worked. And they know from my surveys and their own surveys that this is uh, an idea that actually has solid popular support, even though most people, even in the UAE, as of June, anyway, this is before the peace agreement and just before, and I'm going to measure it again in you know a few weeks and see where we are now. Even though most people in the UAE, to what you hear in the media, uh, actually on a personal level don't want to have relations with Israelis. Okay, um, but they on a on the political level they think it's a good idea for their government to deal with Israel, to offer Israel incentives in order to reach a compromise with the Palestinians. So that's one issue set. I want to just talk very quickly about two other issue sets, Iran and its proxies and uh, terrorism and jihad and Islamic, you know, sort of uh, security and foreign policy issues. So what I have found is when I ask about Iran and Hezbollah and the Houthis and Khamenei and you know all sorts of related questions, whether it's the nuclear program or other things, uh, what should the United States be doing in the region, if anything, or should we just get out and leave them alone? Um, it, it's really quite striking to me that there's a lot of popular anima popular animosity toward Iran and its proxies from Hezbollah to the Houthis uh, to you know, the Syrian regime or Iran's allies in the region. This is not just a government position or an elite position on the part of the Egyptians or the Gulfies or the Jordanians or other Arabs. Now, of course, there are differences inside each country. In Lebanon, there's, uh, Lebanon is very, very polarized on these issues by sect, depending on whether you're you know, Sunni or Shia, and the Christians are right, in, literally right in the middle on issues of Iran and Hezbollah and all the rest of it. But in most of these Arab countries, animosity toward Iran and a desire to contain Iran and to get help from the United States and anywhere else they can in order to do that is very solidly supported by the public, not just by the government or by the ruling elite. Um, Finally, on the issue of jihad and, you know, Islamic reform and, I don't know, all that, that whole complex of issues. So, very briefly, I, I have been pretty encouraged uh, by um, survey findings that show pretty clearly that there was never, since around 2003 or four, much popular support in Arab countries for uh, Al-Qaeda or for Daesh or for any other jihadi terrorist organization. Uh, and uh, in the beginning of Al-Qaeda, there was. Yes, there was. After, right after 9-11, um, there was. The 30%, 40%, you know, a lot of popular support. And then all of a sudden, when terrorist incidents started happening in Arab countries, by jihadis, you could see this country after country. You could see it happening in 2003 and four and five. That support dropped to very little, you know, 10% uh, or less. And with Daesh, Daesh was never popular in any Arab society. Uh, I'm talking about low single digits. Um, and this is you know, not what I think most people thought, uh, or maybe a lot of people still think. They still think that somehow under the surface, there are all these wannabe jihadis lurking around every corner or cafe in 
one Arab country after another. It's just not the case, not the case at all. And um, on the issue of Islamic reform there, or moderation or whatever you want to call it, there the picture is much more mixed. If you ask people, and I think Michael has much more detailed data on questions like this, so I'm going to just say one thing and stop. Uh, I, I, I have a few questions that I've asked about that and um, over the last decade. And my, one of my bellwether questions is, it goes like this. This is the exact wording of the question. We should, do you agree or disagree somewhat or strongly with this statement? We should listen to those among us who are trying to interpret Islam, not reform Islam. They won't let me say that. Who are trying to interpret Islam in a more modern, tolerant and moderate direction. You agree with that or you don't agree with that? And the percentage has been going up in most places that I'm polling in recent years, but it's still only a minority. It's uh, usually at most around 30%, but that's about double what it was five years ago. Thank you. Uh, Michael, do you want to sure, ask? So that, that, I mean, that's a great overview. Thank you, David. Um, you know, one of the, the things that we do find is the same challenge that we really do struggle at times to uh, um, find issues that relate to foreign policy that everyone necessarily um, understands or that they really, you know, find important. And so it is one of the questions where we find educated those who are elites in the city, sometimes those who are, are you know, because it correlates who are, are male tend to have more opinions about such matters. Mm -hmm. Um, and, you know, there's actually only a handful of countries where really we find very strong views such as like Libya or Yemen that are at the midst of civil war and, you know, the foreign powers are there. There are very crystallized views, um, but it is something that we do see is typically less important as we ask a general question. What are the biggest issues facing your country? Foreign affairs rarely come in with the exception of, of some of the, the more war-torn countries, in some cases like uh, Lebanon as well. Uh, Typically on these questions, we see about 20 or 25% of people giving a don't know response, that they don't mm -hmm. know, they don't have an opinion, you know, and, and, and there is always a risk of measuring what we would call non-attitudes, that people respond mm -hmm. to a question in some way mm -hmm. and they don't really have a strong opinion, but they're giving an answer one way or the other. Right. So it is something that is a challenge. And I think, you know, what David described here is, is one of the, the, the challenges to really craft these questions in a way that people give a sense or we get a sense of the importance. Um, you know, one of the things turning to kind of Israel-Palestine um, we do have uh, a number of questions on here. I mean, David has, has many more than we go into, um, but what we typically see or what we really understand people are trying to say is that there is a frustration with Israel. I mean, if you bring up Israel, there is a, a kind of a motive reaction to it um, across much of the region. Um, not necessarily all, but, 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 you know, most people kind of have this. And we actually, sometimes our partners in the region will tell us, you know, please, can we limit these questions because people can explode when this issue comes up. Yet, if we ask, you know, is this the most important issue in a list of questions, it never arises. Mm -hmm. You know, it's really not something that's seen outside of, say, the, the Palestinian context is really the central issue um, or even one of the central issues. And even when we've done ranked choices in the past, it really mm -hmm. falls mm -hmm. fairly low. But, you know, certainly when it has come up, it is something that, that can be, um, you know, something that, that is very powerful. And, you know, one of the things that we've done before is we've asked people on a list of, you know, what country is the greatest threat to you? If we read the list, Israel typically comes out number one. If we don't read the list, Israel actually doesn't appear that high on the uh, on the list mm -hmm. at all. If people don't necessarily think about it, but when it comes up, it is there. Yeah. And, mm -hmm. and one of the the things that we've seen, particularly, I mean, in terms of what you were saying about North Africa, that really the further geographically you get from Israel, the less important the issue is, even when you do probe it directly. Um, you know, Moroccans and, and Tunisians and Algerians tend to you know de-emphasize it more, whereas obviously the Lebanese, I think, as it makes mm -hmm. sense, mm -hmm. tend to elevate it more. Yep. Yeah, even Jordan or, or, or the Palestinians. So it is something that has a real geographic nature. Unfortunately, we haven't really been able to do as much in the Gulf um, lately. Um, you know, we have some, some surveys in the Gulf, but we really don't have as much data from there. So I'd have to rely on what David's done here to kind of lend more direct insight to kind of those, in, those initial, um, you know, pieces and, and kind of the, the, the changes that have been taking place within the Gulf. We, we are doing surveys on this. This is something that's featuring in, in the surveys we're doing. Um, you know, now on the phone. And, and typically this isn't something that necessarily is, is widely supported, but again, you know, it is this kind of probing and there is a social desirability um, on this question itself that, you know, I think there is a sense that, you know, 
there is a quote unquote right answer to give to an interviewer on Israel. It's, it's hard to say that you're supportive of it just because of the nature of the, the environment. So it is a very difficult uh, question to probe. Um, typically, you know, it is something that, that leads to, to a fair amount of frustration, um, you know, amongst a lot of the populations. And, and it is something that we've, we've done on, but it, it, it does need more work. And I think thinking through some of the, the different conditionalities under which support would be higher or lower or what the exact peace process type of, of deal would, um, you know, support would be is something we don't really have data on. But, you know, certainly David's done, done more there. Um, in terms of Iran, I would uh, just quickly say we, our findings show the same thing, that really outside of very few countries, Iran has almost little, no support um, across the region. This is, you know, only support in very yeah. certain um, So there isn't much there. Uh, in terms of the terrorism jihad uh, kind of angle, I mean, uh, that, that David was talking about, we, we, our surveys essentially echo that, you know, when Daesh was, was very strong, we had very low support for them across the board. We published a few things on this, but basically, you know, we find that, that you know, that, that this message just isn't there. And one of the challenges we find is that if we ask directly about these groups, there's almost too little variation to explain who supports them, that we don't have mm -hmm. enough people who are even mm -hmm. willing to do that, no matter how we ask the questions. So, you know, certainly mm -hmm. that's changed and that's, um, you know, gone down over the years, if anything. Um, and, and so that would be all I'd say there. The other piece that I'd mentioned that we were seeing in our surveys right now is kind of the great power competition that really the US versus China and this emerging um, issue is something that we're putting a lot more attention towards. You know, the US has a real strong brand name. It's been there for years. People know it, they feel that they know it. And certainly, you know, I, I think under the current conditions, um, as we've done polling in the last couple of years, the support for Donald Trump is very, very low relative to Putin, relative to Erdogan, relative to the other leaders that we've asked about. I mean, there certainly is frustration there. And I think that's one of the things that's of interest coming up with the next election is, you know, there, there may be a chance, um, you know, seemingly at least pragmatically, perhaps, that, you know, our sense is that, that Biden is probably more supported there. But certainly the other half of that is China. What we are seeing is generally more support or at least you know a greater favorability towards China right now in a way it's a blank slate um, that there isn't really a knowledge that there is a sense that China's developed that China is you know a place that's gotten very wealthy very quickly that China's moving in you know certainly its response after COVID um, you know giving some of the aid giving some of those things seem like it's very positive but also there is this kind of distrust as we actually ask you know there's a huge difference between the percentage of people who say they have a favorable attitude towards China and the attitude towards Xi, whereas with you know, Trump in the United States, they track very closely. There isn't necessarily a knowledge that there is kind of this blank slate, and certainly it's something we want to track going forward. You know, we had initially been thinking about other countries, but in the recent years, certainly China, with the way it's moved in, it is something that we really need to look at carefully uh, as they come into the region. And you know, but it is really unknown, even in a place like Kuwait. If we ask a question uh, on some questions, we get 50% of people saying they don't know about China or certain more detailed questions about China. And it is something that um, I think as China moves in more with the, you know, um, with Bree and everything else that it will become more well known and certainly understanding is China viewed as a neutral power? Is it one that doesn't interfere? Or is it one that's taking advantage of the countries? You know, it might turn very sour that that's some in public opinion, that's something that will need to be tracked and thinking through how the United States and, and China's competition in the region plays out. Sure. Thank you. Um, before we open up to the audience, uh, one last question, and maybe this time around we'll start start with Michael. And that is, as I look at the your both of your surveys, but also other sur uh, polling uh, and surveys that have been done. Uh, what emerges in terms of domestic issues are issues of governance, uh, including issues of corruption, greater desire uh, for participation in government, um, desire for greater degrees of freedom, not necessarily democracy, even though there seems to be a prevalence emerging from a lot of these uh, surveys as democracy being uh, the best of maybe bad options. Uh, and finally, there seems to be a, uh, an ad, a, a, a generational change in terms of attitude towards religion. So away from a more centrally controlled, state controlled, more ritualistic form and experience of religion towards one which is uh, far more individual, in which um, uh, in, you know, individuals clearly see a religion still as a, as a key component of their identity, but what that means and how that translates into their lives and into how they um, 
they practice uh, religion, that seems to be something that they want far greater control of. So perhaps you could talk about these broader issues that seem to be uh, are likely to shape the way these societies are going to look like going forward. And Michael, do you want to start this time? Hello? Sorry, uh, my, my internet seems to be uh, giving me a little problem right now. Can you hear me? Uh-uh. Yeah, yeah. I, hear, I hear you. Hello? Sorry. Yeah. Did you hear us? Or did okay. You? Michael? Oh, shucks. Okay, David, do you want to go ahead? All right. right. I'll, <laughs> I'm sorry, but the technical... Uh, it, it's not me. I'm not doing it. I swear. No, no, but, <laughs> no, no, I'm give Michael a chance. All right. Yeah, we'll we'll come back to him when the, when uh, he's dropped out. We'll t I think he's going to reboot I'm and sure. we'll see if that works. Uh, okay. Michael, are you with us? No. Okay. All right. So I'll 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 say something about. Did, it. did you Those start, are... David? Or oh no, you go ahead. Are you back Michael, online? Back go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. I'm sorry. Did you? Uh... Yeah, my, the internet. Uh... Gremlins hate me, apparently. Sure. Yeah, sure. No worries. Did you get the question? I, I did. I did. So thank you for that. I was, I was actually going to say it's, uh, it, it's very, I, I, I very, this is a, a great question. And certainly it's a lot of the findings we put out from our last wave, it kind of follows exactly uh, from this. And so it is one of the things that we've seen that's very alarming, I think, are the domestic conditions. And certainly the, the trust in government has declined pretty dramatically across the region, you know, falling by almost a, you know, about on average about 20 or 25 points from the time of the Arab uprisings. Um, you know, certainly it's, it's, it's declining. There was, I think a bit, there was a brief, you know, peak after the Arab uprisings, I think a bit of hope um, that the governance issues might improve, that as certain, you know, governments took reforms, um, you know, there were changes across the region, this would improve. It's, it's declined very rapidly and, and, and we've had um, a significant amount on that. You know, a lot of that is the corruption issue, but there is a sense and, you know, perhaps because of social media, this is becoming more well known more spread, you know, stories are being shared and there is a real frustration that, you know, in a case like Tunisia, even after the, uh, the, the uprisings, when the government just took hold, only about two thirds of people said the government was corrupt. And now that's, you know, or there is corruption in the state, that's risen up towards closer to 90% now. Um, you know, this has risen pretty dramatically, um, you know, even in countries that are trying to do this. And part of that may be shining a light on this. It's really shown the degree of corruption there is and that there is kind of a, a challenge with that. And there is a frustration that, you know, the majority of citizens across the region, all countries we've surveyed, say that, you know, the, the governments are not tackling this. They're not being serious about corruption, you know. And, and so we've seen a declining uh, sense of, of governance, decline, you know, a greater sense that corruption is taking place. Um, and amidst that, you know, we do have a, a desire for participation. You know, we are seeing a, a lot of different um, changes, but at the same time, there has been a decline in the sense that, you know, people are free to participate in politics, free to, freedom of speech, freedom of association, freedom of, um, uh, freedom of assembly, all these key rights. If we ask people, are these guaranteed? They've plummeted across the region, falling by about 20 points in even the last few years. There is a sense that governments are cracking down again, you know, trying to, uh, trying to resist some of the pressures that are coming up and perhaps because of the frustration that's boiling up. And so people are sensing, even in a place like Tunisia, that they're losing, you know, their, their ability to have these rights and that, that it's going away. You know, one of the things that we have actually seen too, kind of perhaps related to this is an increasing desire for immigration or to leave one's country. And so this has been declining actually for years since we started doing it and has actually gone up in the last few years as well. So mm -hmm. you know, if you think of exit voice or loyalty, you know, that there is a chance of exit, people want to leave um, potentially, uh, particularly the young generation, but also then the voice. Um, you know, we have this, this idea of, of people are taking part more and more in petitions. You know, we've seen this go up actually pretty dramatically in the last few years on the, our regional averages. People saying that they've taken place in a demonstration, they've taken part in, you know, signing a protest, that they've taken some form of informal action. We're not necessarily seeing a greater, you know, reliance on formal politics, on voting, on other things like this, but certainly taking to the streets. And I think this presage, you know, the, the, what we saw in the, the protests in 2018 and 19, which actually mostly took place, actually in a lot of countries we, we surveyed immediately afterwards, there was a protest. So clearly there must be some association between us doing polling and, and protests breaking out. <laughs> um, but, you know, we did see kind of the, these trends right before they happened. Um, and so there is that sense. And, you know, one of the things we are seeing is that there is still a desire for democracy. Um, 
everyone, particularly the Tunisians, the Iraqis, um, you know, a lot of the different groups have seen the problems of democracy, but there still is a sense there isn't a better system. And that's something that you've hit at. The caveat to that is that when we ask people, how do you define democracy? The vast majority in most countries say it's either, you know, jobs for all or, you know, some other type of benefit. Um, you know, it's not necessarily seen as participatory, free elections. It's really seen as, you know, good governance. So government that might take care of me. And so it is a different definition. So in a sense, that isn't necessarily surprising that this is the desire, that there still is a desire for good governance. You know, I still, despite the challenges democracies face, tend to be somebody who believes that this is, you know, better than the alternative, um, you know, and it is something that would be helpful, I think, to, to get good governance, but there is still mainly a call for good governance across the region. And that's how I would interpret our own democracy findings is, is really thinking about how to improve outcomes. Um, in terms of the generational change, we are starting to see this across the region. One of the big findings that came out of our last survey that was, was fairly well publicized was this increasing percentage of people, particularly young people saying they're not religious. Across the region on average, that rose from about 11% in 2013, saying they're not religious to about 18% um, in the last survey. And, you know, in a place like Tunisia, the most really of all the countries we surveyed, probably the most secular in, in outlook, you know, the, the, the youth cohort, those who are 18 to 29, are about as likely um, to say that they're not religious as young Americans. You know, so this is something that you're seeing in different countries, different changes. Um, and, and it is on the rise across the region. I think the role that religiosity is playing, part of that may be that given the the name that the Islamists, you know, in Egypt and in other places have kind of given, you know, the sense of, a, of, of you know, the, the, how Islam should be governed and how it should play out, you know, even in Tunisia, how this played out, that the young say, I don't really want to be much a part of this, or thinking of religion in a different way, whether it be individualistic, whether it be, you know, kind of more personal practice than kind of the communal, there, there are these changes taking place. We're still tracking that. We had hoped to track this and see how these changes were continuing across the region, because it is a nascent change. It could be reversed. It is something that, you know, is, is a fairly small change, but it is something worth tracking because this is what we've seen in other countries and it may be something we, we start to see across the region and, and only time will tell. But, you know, in a case like Tunisia, we certainly have seen this really taking place at the younger generation. Thank you, David. Okay, uh, thanks very much. Um, yeah, I, I, I think um, what Michael said is right and important. Uh, I've also, uh, found that corruption is a very salient issue across the region. Um, um, I, at the same time, um, I asked people in my most recent surveys, and that means in the last two years, um, about protests and whether uh, they think protests are going to accomplish anything, whether they're uh, good or bad, and um, whether uh, it, it, there's a question that I ask, which um, I have to admit somebody else inspired me to ask it. You know, I often, I do some sort of crowdsourcing sometimes and I ask uh, anybody I know, like, what would you, what question would you ask, you know, if you could do a survey in these countries? And somebody gave me the idea to ask this question, uh, which I think is very, significant and that is it goes like this do you agree or disagree with this statement when i think about what's going on in syria or libya or yemen i actually feel that our situation here is not so bad uh, and i what i get uh, is a majority of people even in you know very poor and repressive countries these days like egypt um, saying yeah I agree with that. Uh, and uh, that helps to explain why it is that even though there's so much dissatisfaction, and there is, um, even in the Gulf countries about corruption, about government incompetence and lack of responsiveness and so on, uh, there is a, a sense that many people have um, that either protests are actually going to backfire or at best be not effective in producing positive change. That's about half the population, but an even larger a majority feels that, well, you know, by comparison, relatively speaking, things aren't as bad in my country as what's going on in Iraq or Libya or Yemen or Syria. So maybe we shouldn't 
up, you know, upset the apple cart so much. Maybe stability is better, even if it in, includes corruption and you know poverty and repression. I mean, it's a sad conclusion, but I think the numbers point at least to some extent in that direction. Uh, now, obviously that, that hasn't been the case in uh, Lebanon or Algeria or Sudan lately, and to some extent in Iraq. And so, you know, that, that, that's not always the way it is. Sometimes people are willing to get out and protest uh, en masse and at great risk to themselves and even violently if frustration reaches some indeterminate threshold and but i think more often they're not most people not willing to do that so i find that let's let me go to the palestinians specifically um you know the peace process is frozen other arabs are making friends with israel behind their backs or over their heads uh the occupation continues and um and, and they're very unhappy with their own governments, both in Gaza and in the West Bank. And yet there's no intifada, there's no, there's no mass protest. So I asked Palestinians, why, why? I, instead of you know, guessing the answer, I said, I, I said, why don't I just go to them and ask them, why aren't you protesting? Why is there no intifada? And I, they answered uh, as follows. First of all, they said, we're afraid of the Israeli reaction, we're afraid of our own government's reaction. We don't trust our leaders to manage protests that <clears throat> lead to a positive outcome. And anyway, we care more about our daily existence than we do about any political issues. And then there was a small percentage, around 20%, who said, well, we still have some hope in a peaceful diplomatic approach to these very difficult problems that we face rather than an intifada or a violent protest, either against Israel or against our own government. So um, I think that the, you know, th this is really a, a conundrum because the, the level of popular dissatisfaction sometimes leads to a revolution or, you know, instability or mass protest or even maybe democratic change, you know, but sometimes it doesn't. And we need to um, understand why and why not. I'll say one thing about religiosity. And um, there, there are some, it's a very mixed picture. Uh, it, if, it may be the, it, that, you know, on the margins and especially in the younger generation, people are becoming less religious or more moderate or more individualistic uh, about Islam or something like that. But, one of the striking findings that I have is that the Muslim Brotherhood, even in countries where it's officially outlawed and labeled a terrorist organization like Egypt or Saudi Arabia or the United Arab Emirates, the Muslim Brotherhood still gets about 25% uh, private popular support. Um, and uh, that's, that's a very striking finding. And I know it's of great interest <laughs> <laughs> and concern to governments in the region and here in the United States, um, because it shows you that there is a segment of society, even in Saudi Arabia, you know, which is supposedly moving in a different direction and cracking down on the Muslim Brotherhood, or in other Gulf countries or in Egypt, um, where that, that is still kind of enamored, at least privately to some extent of that approach to Islam and Islamic politics. And the last thing I wanna say is that we, we've only been talking about Arab public opinion, but the, the, one of the most striking Muslim public opinion trends in the region about religiosity is taking place in Iran and in Turkey. Because that, in those two countries, you see based on the best available, and sometimes they're you know, questionable, but I think they're the best available survey evidence that there's a dramatic decline in personal religiosity and adherence to sort of established Islam uh, in both those countries, uh, precisely because uh, of their government's, um, you know, championship of uh, traditional or even militant Islamic 
practices and rhetoric and values. And uh, that's especially true of the younger generation. So um, the, the numbers are of, for, of literally young Turks or young Iranians who now say that they're not religious at all or that they don't care that much about Islam or that they don't like their government's uh, support for uh, strict Islamic um, regimes and so on, th those numbers are very, very high. I mean, really high and much more so than I, the numbers that I see in uh, Arab societies. Thank you. Um, I'd like to open up to the floor and encourage people to ask questions. Um, either raise your hand or um, uh, type it into the, uh, the uh, MEI events people. Uh, okay, I, I see Alex Ardino. Uh, uh, who's a colleague here at uh, MEI? Alex, do you want to unmute and go on, go on camera? Yes, thank you very much. First of all, uh, a big thank to both presenter. It was very, very interesting and very informative. I have a question uh, to, to David. Uh, it's basically is a methodological question about the sure. way he administered yeah. the surveys. Yeah. Uh, I would like to say you, you mentioned that it's very important that survey. Uh, it's better done in person than online. Yes. Uh, but yes. do you see any generational shift in this trend? Yeah. I mean, younger generation are more prone to use uh, yeah. a square survey or sure. this kind of tools. Uh, sure. Another sure. part of the question yeah. is that uh, as you administer the survey, uh, and you mention it basically as a commercial one, and right. you insert uh, questions yes. that are not related to shampoo and toothpaste. Right. <laughs> is this going to, to change uh, the perception yeah, sure. that, right. sure. uh, or let's sure. say, uh, sure. the gravitas uh, yeah. that uh, sure. your uh, surveys yeah, yeah. respond? Yeah, th those are both uh, great questions. Thank you. Uh, okay, very briefly. Look, uh, the younger generation uh, across, or across much of the region anyway, um, is very plugged in, you know, very wired. Um, they're, they're all hooked up to the internet and they're uh, familiar with and accepting of online surveys. Uh, so more, more so than their elders. Um, but even the older generation, uh, most of them in most places you know, has access to uh, the internet and and uses it and has you know computers readily accessible uh, if not their own then somebody they know or even in poor countries um, and so to me the it, 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 the the issue with online surveys is not penetration as I just I think mentioned very briefly in passing it, it or even familiarity or acceptance. It, it's, it's more of a sampling issue. That, that's the problem. Um, the problem is how do you, how do you get around issues of self-selection? Uh, how do you know that your sample is really representative or random? Um, and uh, it, it, th those are really, really hard problems. And of course, there are many, you know, serious efforts to solve them, uh, some of the companies or organizations, academic or otherwise, um, that, that are in this field use, you know, gigantic pools of people who have agreed to be uh, regular participants in online surveys. They may have several hundred thousand uh, people um, uh, and, and then they sample those at random, you know, um, but um, I'm not, fully satisfied with that <laughs> because even 300,000 people, you know, how do you pick them? How do you, are they self-selected? Have you offered them uh, an incentive? Yes, in many cases. Uh, is that gonna distort uh, the sample and the findings? Um, and uh, I, 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 th those are the issues that, that I have. And I have to say that there are some surveys the of online surveys that uh, some of the more well-known ones uh, that publish their results in the media in the region that won't explain their methodology in any great detail and that really bothers me um, I don't I don't trust them frankly 
Um, and uh, I've come across that, especially with youth surveys um, in the region, I'm sorry to say. And I'm not going to name names, but right now, but um, maybe you know who I'm talking about. So that's an answer to your first question. And the answer to your second question is a great question. I, I've, I've experimented with this issue a lot over the last 30 years about how to construct a survey that is shared with other clients, often commercial or have nothing to do with my political questions and avoid contaminating or prejudicing, or, you know, distorting the results. So there are a couple of basic ways to do that. Uh, one is to, to the extent possible, to make sure that my questions go first. Um, it's a simple thing, a simple fix, but it's very useful because that way the respondents, uh, you know, they only have to answer a few political questions and they haven't been distracted or, um, you know, put into some mindset about shampoo or toothpaste and not taking it very seriously or thinking in commercial or economic terms or something like that before they get to my question. That, that's one way of addressing the issue. That, unfortunately, that, there's a trade-off here because that sacrifices one of the virtues of mixing shampoo and politics, which is to make the respondents feel more comfortable and less threatened um, because they're going to start off with very innocent and day-to-day -day simple questions that they feel very comfortable talking about. And okay, so that leads me to the next fix, which is not perfect, right? Not perfect, but I think it's pretty good. And I, like I said, I've personally watched some of these interviews over many years and experimented with different results. Uh, techniques is how to transition. Let's say that you ask, um, you know, you ask about toothpaste or shampoo, and then it's time to ask about a few political questions. How do you transition in such an artificial way uh, without making the respondent feel uncomfortable or even offended, you know, or somehow um, suspicious or something? So I've experimented with different ways to do that and like trying to make a subtle transition and, or trying to ask some social questions uh, before I get to the really hot political ones. Um, but uh, honestly, I found that the best method in terms of respondents uh, comfort level and I think um, candidness is to simply say outright okay, thank you very much. You, you told me about shampoo and toothpaste. Now I want to switch, if you don't mind, to something completely different. And I'd like to ask you a few questions that are more about politics or social issues. Just come out and say it very openly. Don't be too clever by half and try and fool people because they're not going to be fooled. Uh, and if you do it that way, um, I have found from, as I said, you know, <laughs> too many years of hard experience in the field uh, with these surveys, that, that that seems to work quite well. And um, one way that I know that is that I don't get a lot of people saying, hey, wait a second, uh, I'm, I'm quitting, you know, I'm out of here. I thought this was about shampoo, and now all of a sudden you're asking me about the Muslim Brotherhood? I'm sorry, uh, get out of my house. No, it almost never happens. Uh, and I don't get a lot of people giving me answers about the Muslim Brotherhood that, you know, somehow uh, are tainted by answers about shampoo or toothpaste, because there, there is no, there's not, there's no connection, you know, it's not going to bias them. Uh, at least I can't figure out how that would bias the results in any particular direction. And finally, I'll say one last thing to your, in answer to your excellent question. I, I, I sometimes use um, test questions to gauge um, the level of disingenuous responses. It's an issue that Michael, or if not disingenuous, just sort of, I don't really care, I'll just say whatever comes to mind, you know. Uh, and I don't really have a real opinion about it, I'm just gonna give you some answer. And um, that, that is a problem, and, or an issue. And uh, one of the ways that I do that is to ask awareness questions about things that don't exist. And I know this is a, it's a sneaky trick, uh, but I do it. 
because from time to time. And like I'll ask people how much they've heard or read about somebody or something that never happened or doesn't exist, uh, not even a fictional character. I'll just make something up and ask them if they have an opinion about it or if they've heard about it and how much they've heard about it. And typically across the region, uh, whether it's in Egypt or Jordan or Israel <laughs> or other places where I've done this little sneaky experiment, I get you know somewhere around 25 or 30 percent of the respondents saying, oh yeah, sure, I, I've heard about that or I have an opinion about that, even though it's not a real thing, right? I'm just, it's totally fictitious. So they couldn't possibly have heard about it or have a real opinion about it. Um, and so with that information, what do I do? What do I do? Do I take those people and just delete them from statistically from the respondents because they're people who are lying or not answering seriously or or do I say, well, you know, they're embarrassed. They don't want to admit that they never heard about something uh, even though it doesn't exist, but that doesn't mean that they're lying in answer to all the other questions that I'm asking where they really have heard about it or they do have a real opinion about it. Well, this is a very tough problem and I've tried different statistical ways of, if not solving it, at least approximating a solution to it. And overall, I would say that I don't see a systematic difference in answers to other questions between people who uh, say they've heard about something that doesn't exist or, and the people who admit that they haven't heard about it. So I'm inclined to think that this issue, um, which is related, not exactly the same, but related to the shampoo and toothpaste versus political questions, uh, is, uh, is, is not a uh, disqualifying or serious methodological problem. And I've asked about fictitious political issues and I've asked about fictitious brands of toothpaste. <laughs> in order, uh, I really have, you know, precisely in order to see whether I'm getting real responses or not and what kinds of people and how many of them are um, kind of making things up or giving me a courtesy response um, because they think they need to say something. So, um, I hope that at least begins to answer your question. It's not perfect, but I, I think it's, as I said before, I really do think based on a lot of experience uh, and some you know, mistakes and trial and error, I think uh, these methods work really quite well. Thank you very much. Can I, can I add something actually about the online surveys too? Oh, please do. Because I, I, I agree with David what he said that you know, certainly for the type of surveys we do, the methodology isn't established to have a nationally representative sample from the, the online opt-in panels that exist in the Middle East to this point. You know, there's attempts to try and get around that. Um, you know, certainly in the United States at this point that you know, face-to-face -face is too expensive basically. Right. Um, you know, phone surveys are getting about you know, sometimes two to 3% response rates that online panels are about the only option left. So there's been a real effort to make these non-probability based samples functional here. And I think that there's been kind of a copy of that in the Middle East that, you know, people are advertising these as fairly cheap uh, alternatives that they look like the nationally, they look like the population at large, so they must represent that. But, you know, it's taken a huge amount of time. There's been a huge number of mistakes made in the U.S. environment that have not been accurate. And so I, I have trouble placing, you know, faith in that. At the same time, there are uses of this, which is that if you're not looking for nationally represented population, this can be a great way to explore public opinion, whether it be with an experiment, whether it be with some other, you know, type of, of element that you can learn from and then potentially generalize. And so it is something that we have thought about engaging, but certainly as David said, you know, there are surveys out there that claim to be representative that don't really publish their methodology, particularly targeting, you know, youth um, and youth issues. And, you know, that is really a huge problem to, to make the claims that they do on that basis. So, again, I wouldn't say all online panel surveys are bad, but there is a caution to be used with what they're claiming and what they can actually claim validly from the methodology. Right. Thank you. Well, uh, uh, okay. Um, I mean, look for another colleague from the Middle East Institute. Please go ahead, I mean. Hi. Hi. Can you guys hear me? Yes, we yeah. can. Okay. Hi, David. Hi, Michael. Hi. Thank you so much for, for the talk. Sure. Uh, 
Um, I also have uh, one uh, sort of more methodological question and one question about Middle East. So the yeah. one question about uh, the Middle East, I'm wondering if, like, if we look at surveys um, longitudinally uh, yep. and see change over time, would yep. you say that changes across different countries corroborate with each other? Like, if there's a wave uh, of change across the Middle East, uh, um, yeah. it's, it, it shows across. And if it does, uh, then is it, it does it make sense for us to even, like, do national uh, publics matter? Or can we just talk about, like, an Arab public? Uh, or sort of non-Arab public? Can we talk about those? <laughs> um, so yeah. uh, that is one question. And the other question is, I, I'm wondering, like, if... Um, like where you put a question in a survey, does that matter? Yeah, yeah sure. Uh, like if, yeah. It, if it comes very later on, people are tired, bored, sure, stop sure. answering. And sure. um, do you ever put like uh, open-ended questions uh, yeah. in a survey? Like asking yeah. people, what, you know, what do you sure. think is the most important? Yeah, sure. Now? Yeah, sure. Yeah. So those are my questions. Thanks. Thanks. Michael, uh, do you want to? All right. Sure. Um, yeah. So... The, the bottom line is, is I, I would say that typically I would be very cautious about saying there's one Arab public. I mean, there's a huge variation. Um, Yemen and Qatar have very little in common besides speaking a language, um, you know, uh, that, that, that they share. I mean, they're, they're geographically fairly close, but the differences are massive. Um, that said, we do at times break and, and you can see certain publications we have that are actually looking at changes over time. Um, and one of the things we do see is that trust in government, for instance, I mentioned earlier, has declined across the region. It's something that has varied uh, by country. You know, certain countries it's gone down by more, but it is a general trend. And so we do talk about that at times. And I think it is useful to think about, you know, what are the broader trends we're seeing? And, you know, David mentioned some of these as well. But at the same time, I think we do see huge differences depending on the question. Um, if it's on things that relate to politics or the political system, the countries that are more authoritarian, the countries that are less authoritarian, the countries that are experimenting with some form of opening democracy, dare you, I say, um, type of situation that they all have different interactions and often they're learning from what's happening in their own country more than they are what's happening abroad. There are some effects of what's happening elsewhere, but I, I would not, I would say that, you know, typically we need to look at it in different, you know, countries at times, dare I say, I, I, I think we also may need to look at it within countries that, you know, there are huge differences within countries, you know, in Lebanon being an obvious example where you have yeah. different, you know, regions, different sects other places where, um, you know, you have, you know, Northern and Southern Tunisia have very different attitudes as well. So I, I'd always be cautious about aggregating. We tend to aggregate, we tend to think about that. There are some trends that we would see across the region, but for the majority of trends, we would see it in some countries, um, but, but not others. So I would be cautious about, um, you know, pooling the, the results, um, you know, particularly uh, if you think about the Gulf to Morocco, it's, it's such a wide variation. For your second question, um, it does matter where we put a question. I think David highlighted this, that, you know, we generally start with questions that are more general, trying to get a sense of, you know, interaction that is a, in some sense, as a social occasion that we, you know, are in there in a house, like doing something fairly strange. This isn't something that people in the region do routinely. So getting a sense of back and forth, it's safe to give these answers, giving people questions they feel that they know about and, you know, getting a, a kind of, you know, rapport between the interviewer and the the respondent putting them at the end can be really challenging because people are tired at times they say you know enough i've, I've this is a long survey typically face to face because it is so expensive goes long it's 45 minutes sometimes longer and people can get frustrated at that point um, with our surveys we generally find people at the end say it was an interesting survey a long survey but an interesting you covered a lot of topics um, you know but there is a, a fatigue that we see and so that is something that that you know we try and balance it so that it moves around so that people are answering different questions they aren't answering the same question over and over again um, they feel and you know that there is movement so it is kind of something we, we do balance we do use open-ended surveys or questions at times um, it's it's something that we've leaned away from to some extent it is a challenge to analyze to aggregate as people are, are doing it and also um, you know even recording it can be uh, sometimes difficult so we want to use the data that we collect the fortunate thing is that, you know, the world is changing. And even if uh, I'm not, you know, the best program in the world, we do have, you know, programmers on our team now can actually do text analysis, can actually print this out, can actually look for patterns, work, look for correlations within that. So it is something that we're actually engaging more again. We did this in our early years. We kind of backed away for, for a number of years, not because it's not interesting, not because it's not, um, you know, something that's worth doing, but just because it is really hard if we do like we did last year, 25,000 interviews, it's really hard to process that amount of open-ended yes. data. 
So, I mean, we're trying to get back to that because I think we learn a lot more and I always learn a lot from the open-ended questions when I go through them and code them, but it, it, it is something that using machine learning, using, you know, text analysis or text-based analysis will help us do. So we're excited to, to bring those back. Okay, let me, thank you. Uh, I'll take a quick stab at, at both of those excellent questions. Um, uh, I, I agree that there are some general trends, but also that it's really a mistake to lump all Arab countries together. Um, there's no single Arab street. There are many different Arab streets. I wrote that 30 years ago in a, a monograph. <laughs> first, the first thing I published on this topic um, at the Washington Institute, and I think it's even more true today uh, than, than it was then. Um, and I, I want to just give a particular example, uh, because you asked about longitudinal trends, you know, over time, of one important issue on which uh, the Palestinians uh, have gone in the opposite direction over time compared to other Arab publics. Uh, today, if you ask the Palestinians whether they support a two-state solution, uh, the, the latest number, this is not from one of my polls, but it, it corresponds very closely to the poll that I did in February. This is from September. Uh, it's only 39% of the Palestinians who support a two-state solution. That's a minority among the Palestinians, and it's a majority among the, uh, a large majority, um, you know, two thirds or more in every other Arab country where I have polled. Um, so, and this has changed over time. The Palestinians have gone down 20 or 25 points on that question and other Arab publics have gone up 20 or 25 points on that question. <laughs> Uh, over the last decade or so. So, um, or even actually, I, I would say that happened even more quickly. It's actually over just since 2014, to be precise. So um, you can't, you know, be too quick to generalize about all of the Arabs. That's a big mistake. Um, and as, as Michael said, even within one country, and I'm gonna use the Palestinians as another example. And uh, you know, part of the reason I'm doing this is I just wrote a hundred page monograph about Palestinian public opinion, so, uh, which you can find on the Washington Institute website or on Fikra Forum, the blog that I uh, run at the Washington Institute. Um, the Palestinians are, are very divided internally um, depending on where they live. And the people in the West Bank have quite different attitudes compared to the people in Gaza, for example. Uh, and the people in East Jerusalem who live under a very different um, uh, system of uh, laws uh, because they're under direct Israeli rule with some advantages to that and some disadvantages. Um, the, the people in East Jerusalem have, and that's about 300,000 or, you know, not quite 10%, more than 350,000, not quite 10% of the total, but they're, they're a different population just within the Palestinian community that has quite different attitudes on a number of key issues compared to their Palestinian cousins, you know, just a few miles away. So sweeping generalizations are, are are dangerous uh, in this context. Now, on can I, can I, can I just ask, ask a, yeah, I just want sure. to like, like a clear point of clarity. I, I oh, mean, yeah. my point, I mean, my point, yeah. Yeah, sorry, I want to give Asif a, a chance to ask okay. you. Okay. All right. Yeah, and we'll so, uh, at the end. Okay, so, okay. Let me, my apologies. Okay. Let me just say something about open ended questions. I, I love open ended questions. I, I agree with Michael. They, they often, provide amazing insights because you're giving people the freedom not to ask about what you think they should, you know, they're not giving them the options that you think are the options, but just opening up for any option that, that's on their mind. And, uh, but they are expensive and complicated. And I'm delighted to hear that there are better ways of processing uh, all of that information, because I've had exactly the same experience. I, I, I used to use them 
sparingly, but regularly, uh, because they were so interesting. And now I've moved away from that because it's just really expensive and difficult. And I, I, I have found, uh, I just want to give one very concrete example of this, in, in, which is a poll that I did in Jordan about 10 years ago, when I just asked in an open-ended way, uh, when you hear the phrase two-state solution to the Palestinian-Israeli conflict, what, what comes to your mind? Just open-ended. You can say anything you want. Do you? And what I found was an astonishing difference between the Jordanians of Palestinian origin and the Jordanians of East Bank origin. Um, and uh, and it, when you ask an open-ended, you'd never get this from any other kind of question, but when you ask that in an open-ended way, just like that, I found that the plurality response of the East Bankers was two-state solution, good. That means all the Palestinians will go back where they came from. And, when, and the plurality of the Palestinians in Jordan said two-state solution, no good. We want all of Palestine, not just part of it. So uh, really remarkable. I mean, polar opposites uh, for totally different reasons within the same country, within the same one small Arab country. And you, you wouldn't have guessed that had you not asked an open-ended question that allowed people to say whatever they felt like. So I, I, I'd be happy to see more of that in your surveys, Michael, or if my boss gives me a bigger budget in my surveys in the future. Thank you. I, I want to give Asif the last question, but ask sure. both Asif as well as the speakers to be, to be brief, because unfortunately sure. we're getting towards sure. the end of this. Sure. Asif, go ahead. Uh, thank you, uh, James. Uh, very brief, uh, my question to both the speakers is, uh, since uh, uh, this knowing the people's mind uh, is a power which is possessed only by the God. So it gives a huge power. So with that power, is there any responsibility that also comes that you consider ethical issues? If you could comment on that, please. Thank you. Right. Michael, do you want to go first and then? Sure. I'm helping you give this to David. This is a great question. Um, <laughs> It, it is something yeah. that I, I think is a, a, a huge challenge. I mean, I think that we get, we get criticized from all sides because we didn't do this the right way. We didn't do it, you know, something else. And certainly questions we ask that we choose to ask certainly do set an agenda in a way. And I, I think that, you know, there is a, a real um, challenge to that. You know, one of the things we try and do is, you know, David's mentioned this before, is really try and get questions from a broad group of people. We try and figure out what are the issues that matter to, you know, the places in the region and, and really make it something that's of the region as well. So, you know, we, we do run it from Princeton, but we, we have contacts, we work with, you know, getting questions, developing it and, and trying to figure out what are the kind of critical questions that people in the region want, that people outside the region want, and then also to, you know, be a bit humble with, with what we can do. You know, we certainly have our own interpretations. As far as I'm concerned, you know, what we really try and do is say the data are the data, you know, you we can, maybe we did it wrong, maybe we didn't do it as well as we could have, but at the end of the day, you can look at the data, you can see the data, and you can, you can evaluate it and come to your own conclusions. You know, there is the project, and our job is to try and get the best data we can using the, the leading methods, leading everything else. Are we perfect? Absolutely not. You know, there are huge, huge challenges in working in this region, but we do try and do that to give people that resource. And then in our own, you know, capacity, we're imperfect, we're all humans, but we do, you know, try to understand what we're seeing, try to give that interpretation and try to inform policymakers because some data is better than no data at any point. And, you know, it's something that I love to do is just take, go to forums like this, talk to people. I, when I used to go travel region, go to the region, see what we're finding, talk to as many smart people as I can and really try and understand what on earth is it that we're, we're doing? How can we do that and improve it? So and I think there is a lot of responsibility you know, we, we do the best we can with it. Um, you know, we're not perfect by any stretch, but, um, you know, our goal is to, to, to do all we can and to really shed light on this because there aren't that many surveys. You know, David does some, Zogby does some, there's a few others, but this is a region without a whole lot of, you know, without much data on this compared to the fact that every day we get 10 presidential polls or more. You know, <laughs> it is something that, that, right. that is really important to do. And, and, you know, in certain cases, we probably are, 
um, one of the few, if only, surveys that actually takes place every one to two years. I mean, that's a huge amount of time to go through. So we want to do it right. Um, and, and so we do our best and, and try and do that collectively. David. OK. Uh, yeah, so uh, thanks for the question. Uh, and thank you for attributing um, you know, so much power and responsibility to, <laughs> to our humble um, academic or quasi-academic research efforts. I, I, you're, you're actually right. Uh, you're, you're asking a great question. Um, it, it, it's uh, because, um, the, the, as Michael just said, because there there aren't you know that many such surveys. That sometimes uh, it may be the case that this a survey that we do will become some sensational news item or some key driver of some government's policy or uh, some controversial issue that polarizes people uh, in some way. And, and, uh, it, and that, 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 that is uh, a serious and a humbling challenge. Uh, and I, I, I would try to address it in the following ways, uh, in addition to what Michael said, and um, I'm guessing that he probably shares a lot of this with me. Number one is to do the very best that is humanly possible to be neutral and um, objective and scientific, or at least uh, professional about the way the surveys are done. Not to ask loaded questions, not to indulge in, as somebody mentioned this question, in sequence, deliberate sequence bias, uh, kind of leading the respondents to some predetermined result by the order in which you ask the questions. Uh, some pollsters do that, and it's wrong, uh, in my view. And, and to um, uh, try to make sure that the work that we do is up to the best professional standards. That's number one. Number two is to publicize our work. We don't, I don't uh, do anything that is secret or that, uh, you know, I, I only show to some people but not to others um, because I, I, I want people to be able to see what I'm doing, to be transparent about it, to interpret the full range of results in the way that they think is right, not just in the way that I present, and to argue about it if, uh, if they want. Um, and uh, and that's, what, that's actually what happens. You know, we get a lot of feedback. I welcome your feedback um, on, uh, um, on my surveys or on this whole issue of survey research in Arab countries. And um, I think that that helps keep us honest and, and uh, kind of um, also aware of um, how these surveys are not a substitute for full democracy, but they are at least a window into people's aspirations that they might not otherwise have. And that's in the long run, probably good for them and good for us on the outside who are trying to understand what's really going on in this very turbulent region. Thank you. We no doubt could go on for another hour and a half, and I, would love, <laughs> and I would love to, but we've already taken a significant chunk out of David and uh, my <laughs> Fresh. Uh, it's past yeah. my bedtime, you know. Uh, <laughs> Thanks for staying up. I, you know, sorry for the amount of time. So. <laughs> in, in all fairness to them, this has really been a, a very fascinating and I thought very insightful. Well, thank you. Uh, seminar, and I certainly, and I'm sure that everybody else on on the on the webinar has learned a great deal. Uh, so thank you very much for this. Before sure. I, uh, so uh, before the MEI events uh, team, whom I'd like to thank also for having facilitated this, pull the plug on us. Let me invite everybody for tomorrow's webinar uh, by the Middle East Institute, which is part of its MEI 101 series series at, uh, on women and youth as a force of change in the region.
It's at nine o'clock GMT, five o'clock Singapore time. Again, thank you very much for the audience for joining us. Thank you particularly to uh, Michael and David for having been so generous both in your sure. time and your My pleasure. All My the pleasure. best. Yeah. Thank Thanks you. so much. Okay.